the nuclear forces and how the idea about these uh, nuclear forces comes into line and uh, uh, what type of forces uh, like uh, uh, which ha which exist between these uh, nucleons which are present within the nucleus and we will talk about uh, a little, little bit about the jikawa theory of uh, mesons and how these mesons so they are uh, exchanging between these protons and neutrons and how the identity of this neutron and proton it changes within the nucleus apart from that we will talk about the neutron proton ratio and the stability curve and which gives us the idea about why some nuclei or why some atoms they are more stable as compared to other atoms then we will discuss about the binding energy and uh, what is the difference between this binding energy and binding energy per nucleons and how we can find out uh, from this binding energy curve uh, which uh, atom or which nuclei they are more favorable to nuclear fusion and which uh, nuclei they are more favorable to fission or spontaneous fission and then we will discuss a little bit about the packing fraction and uh, how we can find out uh, the uh, uh, the change in packing fraction uh, packing fraction how it uh, changes the stability of the nuclei and then we will discuss some important numericals related to this today's topic in this lecture we have discussed about uh, the rutherford scattering uh, experiment and uh, the uh, rutherford explained that there is some sort of uh, a highly positive charge uh, which exists within the nucleus and he divined that there is a nucleus which exists within the center of the atom and the electron they are surrounded in the discrete energy orbits so nucleus it consists of protons and neutrons so this uh, got finalized after the discovery of uh, neutrons maybe in the early 1930s so if you look at the nucleons i represent the term nucleon that is either it can be a proton or it can be a neutron and now if we talk about the nucleus so if they are exist within the nucleus so proton they are carrying a positive charge and they are some sort of having electrostatic force of repulsion so which exists between these protons and for example if we are talking about a higher atomic nuclei and there are many many protons which are existing within the nucleus and these large number of protons so they can have some sort of uh, electrostatic or coulomb repulsion so which leads to uh, that uh, the nucleus it cannot be a stable body for a long time so these forces uh, of electrostatic repulsion so let me select a pen so these electrostatic forces of repulsion between these nucleus they cause the nucleus to fly apart now if we compare about the uh, gravitational force of attraction which exists between these neutron and this force it is too small that it cannot account for the binding energy of these nuclei and the nucleus it cannot be a stable body for a long time so the presence of uh, so it gives us the idea that apart from these electrostatic or gravitational forces there is some sort of another force which exists between these uh, nucleons and which is binding these nucleons and that force is known as the nuclear force so this force it is a very short range force and it is a attractive force which is binding all those nuclear particles so the nuclear attractive force it is a stronger force than the coulomb forces and they are very very short range forces so if we compare about the four type of forces the strong nuclear forces they are the strongest forces which exist in this universe now which gives that uh, the idea of these uh, in, in, uh, idea of these existence of uh, these nucleons in the uh, nucleus uh, because uh, so this has been given by a japanese physicist that is the jukawa so he gave the idea in 1936 so he compare uh, he take the analogy of uh, the uh, photons like for example uh, in the quantum mechanics if we talk about the electromagnetic force and so there is a change of photon which exists between these electromagnetic radiations and similarly if we talk about the gravitational force and there is some sort of uh, exchange of particles which we generally known as gravitons 
so this idea of electromagnetic forces it has uh, the the yukawa it take the analogy of this uh, model and he predicted that so there is some sort of uh, particles which also exist and these particles they are continuously exchanging between these protons and the neutrons and due to these particles so there is some sort of uh, force which is binding these protons and the neutrons and this force is known as the nuclear force and this exists due to these mesons so what happens for example this is a proton and suppose this is a neutron and there is some sort of a meson clouds which exist all across these nucleons and these mesons so they are exchanging their identity from one nucleon to another nucleons and due to that so there is some sort of attraction which exists between these nucleons now according to this yukawa theory so all the nucleons so they are like identical cores which are surrounded by a core of these mesons and later after the discovery of these mesons or pions so they are also known as the pions so they have been also found in the cosmic radiations and later they find out the mass of these uh, pions so it is something like 270 times the mass of electron so what they says that so these mesons they can be neutral mesons so neutral mesons so it can be pi meson plus mesons and it can be minus meson particles and the difference between these proton and neutron it is supposed to be the composition of these respective meson clouds so for example a neutron it emit a pi minus mesons and it converts into proton so if you check this reaction so this neutron so it get converted into proton by emitting pi minus mesons and the vice versa so you can see that a neutron if absorb this a particle like proton similarly so it can converted into neutron by emitting this pi meson particle so the identity of these protons and neutron it is continuously changing when these meson clouds so they are jumping from one nucleon to another nucleon so which are also binding these protons and neutrons within the nucleus and if we talk about these neutral mesons so suppose some neutron or some proton which is in the excited state and when they lose some of its energy and these excited proton they converted into the ground state energy proton and they are emitting some neutral mesons and similarly these excited neutrons so they are converted into neutrons so by emitting these neutral mesons so the proton and neutrons so they are continuously emitting and absorbing these mesons and their identity it is continuously changing so that's why you can see that so it is quite unpredictable like for a radioactive nuclei so what type of particle it is emitting and what is the half life of a nuclei so and so so that we will discuss also in this nuclear stability belt now what are the main characteristics of these nuclear forces now nuclear forces they are very much attractive in nature and these if you look at this graph so suppose when these two nucleons so they are at a order of 0.5 femtometer so up to that their forces are attractive when these two nucleons so they try to come between more closer or less than these 0.5 femtometer then the identity of these forces it become repulsive so the nuclear forces they are attractive as well as repulsive but most of the time they are attractive forces so they become repulsive when these two nucleons so they come very much closer so in order to avoid these collisions so then the meson cloud it changes its identity between these nucleons and these forces they become repulsive and when these two nucleons so they starts to apart from each other then these forces they become attractive and they do not want that new nucleon to leave that nucleus and up to the range of like uh, between 4 to 4.2 femtometer 
so once this crosses this limit of 4.2 femtometer then these nucleons it leave the nucleus and then that particle either it is a proton or neutron so this become this particle become free so that you have already discussed like discussing or like studying in the deuteron problem why deuteron it is a loosely bound structure and why there is no excited state exist between this uh, deuteron problem so that's why uh, because the binding energy of this deuteron it is of the order of 2.25 mega electron volt and this is this is binding these nucleons and the in the excited state the energy which is of the order of like uh, quite high uh, 238 mev so which is much much greater than the binding energy of these deuterons so that's why there is no excited state which exists between uh, for the deuteron problem so second uh, you can see that the nuclear forces they are very short range forces so like i have told you so they are uh, attractive forces in the range of 0.5 to 4.2 femtometer and when this distance it is less than 0.5 femtometer then these forces are repulsive and when this value between the uh, the distance or the range between these two nucleons it exceeds to 4.2 femtometer so this value it is not fixed uh, it varies between the uh, uh, what type of atomic uh, or atom we are talking about so then these forces they are the bond between these nucleons they get broken and there is no much nuclear force which exists so they are very short range forces either they are the strongest forces so another important feature of these saturation of this nuclear forces now what do you mean by saturation of nuclear forces so if i talk about this nucleus suppose i have a nucleus and there are many many number of nucleons so they exist between these nucleons so some nucleons or proton or neutron so they are falling on the surface of this nucleus now if i am talking about this nucle uh, neutron uh, nucleon which is in the center of this nucleus so it has some sort of a attraction with some neighbor nucleons now if the distance between this nucleon and this nucleon this is very very high then this interaction it decreases with the increase in distance so there is a saturation so the binding energy it is not almost the same for all the nucleons which are present within the nuclei so the value of this interaction it decreases with the decrease in this Uh, with the increase in this distance so this is known as the saturation of nuclear forces and so this is something like uh, the binding energy which is directly proportional to the mass number uh, how many nucleons which are present and using this saturation of nuclear forces we will discuss about the analogy of the liquid drop model so i will not go much in detail so liquid drop model the which if you look at that uh, the if i try to heat a 2 gram of water molecule and it is taking 1 minute for the evaporation and similarly if i increase the number of nucleons and and i change from this 2 gram to 4 gram of water molecule then it will take almost the double time and this is due to the saturation of nuclear forces as i changing the number the mass number of these nucleons so the binding energy the interaction it is also changing at the time so it also gets changed so another property of this nuclear uh, forces that is the spin dependence of these nuclear forces now if you talk about this uh, proton and neutrons so both are fermions so fermions means so having half integral spin so that is of the order of uh, h by 2 and so these forces they are spin dependent so if i talk about the one nucleon or one neutron which is interacting with the one proton and if this neutron it is having up spin and the new proton with which it is interacting it is having again the up spin then their spin is parallel and they have more strong interaction rather than if the neutron which is interacting with the proton which is having a 
down spin so this type of interaction where both the particles they are parallel so you have studied that there is uh, some sort of triplet interaction which exist and in this case there is the singlet interactions which exist and the triplet uh, interaction it is much much greater as compared to the singlet interaction so this generally we use for the ortho and para hydrogen so when you discuss or solve the concept of this total differential cross section of uh, np scattering or pp scattering so you can find out the total differential cross section how it changes uh, when a neutron it is interacting with proton and when a proton it is interacting with proton and so the total differential cross section that is the sum of triplet scattering cross section so 3/4 part it is due to the triplet scattering cross section and 1/4 part that is due to the singlet scattering cross section so spin so these nuclear forces they are spin dependent forces so for the parallel spin so it has a stronger nuclear interaction as compared to the anti parallel spin so nuclear forces another property is they are charge independent so if we talk about any type of nucleon interaction like np or nn or pp so they are independence of charge so what does it means it means that the interaction between any two nucleons it is independent of whether one or both nucleons so they have any electric charge or not so the charge independence of nuclear forces has been it has been proved experimentally as well so when we are doing uh, some sort of np and pp scattering interactions at lower energy so if we are shooting these uh, neutron or proton uh, to a any solid target like uh, a spray jet target or like paraffin wax target and they have proved experimentally that if we are considering the energy of this shooting particle of the order of 10 mv and using schrodinger wave equation if we try to find out the differential cross section the scattering amplitude and they have found that these these type of forces for all type of interactions so they are independent of charge so these are some of uh, the important features of these nuclear forces now if we talk about uh, the stability of this nuclei why some nucleus they are more stable as compared to another nuclei so this we can identify from the value of state stability now how we can predict which kind of nuclear decay which kind of radiation so whether it will emit beta radiation whether it will emit beta plus radiation or which we call positron decay or whether it will emit alpha radiations so this we can find out from the ratio of this n over z so neutron to proton ratio so this ratio is quite important in order to find out the stability of the nuclei how many isotopes which exist for a particular nuclei now if we looking at uh, this graph which i will show you in the next slides so from that you can see that in that particular range of this valley so the particles which exist or the atoms which exist in that uh, stability belt so they are more stable as compared to another so this is the yellow shaded region so this region is reflecting those nucleus or those atoms which lie within this region so they are more stable as compared to other atoms which which are lying within this region or which are lying within this region now if you look at this neutron to proton ratio so this red line it is uh, representing that when a particular atom or a particular nucleus it is having the same number of neutrons and same number of proton so if you look at this graph so up to a value of n is equal to z is equal to 20 so 
दीज न्यूक्लियाई दे आर द मोस्ट स्टेबल दे आर मोस्ट स्टेबल न्यूक्लियाई अप टू एटॉमिक नंबर ऑफ 20 नो एज वी इंक्रीज द एटॉमिक नंबर यू विल सी दैट रादर फॉलोइंग दिस n ओवर z इज इक्वल टू 1 रेशियो सो दिस स्टेबिलिटी बैट इट इज अ स्लाइट टिल्टेड टुवर्ड दिस न्यूट्रॉन वेयर न्यूट्रॉन नंबर इज मोर एज कंपेयर टू प्रोटॉन नंबर now similarly if you check for this particular rubidium so 4400 so in this case the n over z ratio that is around 1.27 and similarly if you check for this mercury where neutron to proton ratio it is almost uh, uh, one and half times greater as compared to this so when the number of nuclei so it exceeds 83 and all those nuclei so which are having a very high number of protons greater than 83 and they are unstable nuclei so all the nuclei so which are not lying within this yellow stability belt and that all nuclei they are the unstable nuclei similarly if you talk about the most of the radioactive nuclei so they are the unstable nuclei which is having a atomic number greater than 83 and those radioactive nuclei they are continuously emitting some sort of radiation either in the form of beta minus uh, radiation beta plus radiation or alpha radiation and they are trying to come to uh, closer to this stability region so life if i if i talk about this uranium so due to that nuclear fission that uranium it try to lose its energy and break up into small fission fragments and by doing so it is trying to come closer to this nuclear stability belt so further looking at this graph so this is the same graph which i have shown you in the previous slide now what are the important features which we can find out from this graph the stable nuclei lie in a very narrow band so which is representing this neutron to proton ratio so this red dotted lines so they are representing the most stable nuclei which exist in our periodic table so the ratio of neutron to proton in stable nuclei it gradually increases as the number of proton in the nucleus it increases so you can see that as we increase the atomic number of nuclei so with the increase in atomic number so this ratio so it gradually increases the ratio here like for a 20 here ratio is 1 for like a rubidium so this ratio is 1.25 for a more higher atomic number this ratio ratio is 1.53 so what does it mean so it means that light stable nuclei such as carbon or oxygen so they have the same number of neutron and proton and they are also stable nuclei so heavy nuclei like mercury so they contain 1.55 times the number of neutrons as compared to neutron uh, as compared to proton so they are more stable nuclei no why this ratio it needs to be increased no if we are increasing the number of proton and due to this electrostatic force of repulsion so between these protons so which becomes too high now in order to cancel those electrostatic coulomb repulsion <coughs> we need to add extra number of neutrons so that we can keep that particular atom or a nucleus in stable form so there are no stable nuclei which exist whose atomic number is greater than 83 so all the atomic number with greater than 83 so they are unstable nuclei so which are lying somewhere in this region or somewhere in this region so the narrow band of stable nuclei it is surrounded by a sea of instabilities so something like this red uh, let me mark with the blue color okay so this red 
nucleus so they are something very very stable nuclei like these are the nuclei which are less stable as compared to this red line but they are trying to lose some of the neutron or proton and they are trying to tame the most stable uh, stability so nuclei that lie below this valley don't have enough neutron and therefore they are known as neutron poor so this tend to decay positron emission or electron capture so all those atom or nuclei which, which lie below this stability belt somewhere here so they are having more number of proton as compared to neutron and they are generally known as neutron poor nuclei and they undergo positron emission or electron capture so by doing so they are trying to move closer toward this Uh, stability belt so similarly the nuclei that lie above this valley they are neutron rich nuclei so all those nuclei which exist somewhere here so they are known as neutron rich nuclei and they tend to under, undergo beta minus decay so by doing so they are moving close to this uh, nuclear stability bad so we will do one or two example and then you will get clear so the nuclei that lie beyond these valley so somewhere like here so they are like alpha particle emitters so which are somewhere here so which are lying beyond this stability red line so this is uh, the graph which is showing that the farther away a nuclei is from the value of stability the shorter is its half life so those nuclei which are lying close to this valley so they are more stable and therefore they are having a large half life period as compared to those nuclei which are lying somewhere here or somewhere here so they are unstable nuclei and they have short half life period so number of stable nuclei which exist for a particular nucleus so how we can identify so if you look at this uh, uh, periodic table you will see that so even even nuclei they are the most stable nuclei even even nuclei means those nucleus who is having even proton number and even neutron number so all those atom who has even proton number and even neutron number they are the most stable nuclei so if we talk about the odd mass nuclei then these are two examples we also call it as odd a nuclei so in this case so either one neutron it can be odd or either proton it can be odd now these are less stable as compared to odd even even so even even is the most stable even odd or odd even they are less stable now why they are less stable so this we will discuss when we discuss about the spin and angular momentum of these nucleons which are fermion and when you find out that so the particle the nucleon which is existing in this last nuclear shell so it is having some spin and due to that it is unstable and that's why it is having some sort of a change in angular momentum so if we talk about this carbon 613 example so here proton number is even and neutron number that is odd having seven number of neutron which is odd nuclei so carbon so so sometimes there is a question c612 and 
C613. So they can ask you which is a most stable nuclei. Then you can see that this is a even even nuclei. So this carbon 612, it is more stable as compared to carbon 613. So similarly, the least stable or the unstable nuclei are those nuclei. So which is having odd number of proton and having odd number of neutron. So they are the least stable nuclei. So there are almost five nucleons or five atoms, so which are the least stable nuclei. Now, <clears throat> so this is the summary which I have explained you that if the Z that is greater than 83, so then these are the unstable nuclei. And if Z is less than or 83, then you have to figure it out. So whether the given nucleus or the given atom, it is having large number of neutrons or having less number of neutron. Now, if it is having large number of proton, a neutron as compared to proton, then this nucleus, it will lie above the stability belt. If it is having less number of neutron, then it will lie below this stability belt. So these make conclusions. So from this, by not looking at this stability belt, you can get the idea about what nucleons are more stable or what nucleus they are more stable as compared to this nucleon. Now, using this value of stability, we can predict which particular nucleus or which particular atom it will emit a beta minus particle or it will emit a beta plus particle. Now, if you look at this graph, so all those nucleons which are above this stability, value of stability region, so they all are beta minus emitter and all those nucleides which are below this stability belt, they are beta plus emitter. Now how you can see that how they are beta plus or how they are beta minus emitter. Now, so I will show you just a minute. <clears throat> Suppose a nuclei which is lying somewhere here, now when it is undergoing a beta decay, suppose if I take the example of carbon 614 and when it is emitting a beta minus particle and we know that, so there is increase of atomic number by one, so this carbon it changes into a nitrogen and it will emit a beta minus particle, a minus one electron zero. Now how it happens, so suppose this carbon, it is lying somewhere here, and when this will emit, so in this case is, so its proton number, it changes by one. So the value of Z, so it changes from six to seven, and you can see that the neutron number, it decreases by one. So in this case, there are six proton and eight neutron. And in this case, there are seven proton and seven neutron. So when this carbon, it changes into nitrogen, trying to come to the more stable region, more stable nuclei. So proton number, it is increased by one and neutron number, it decreased by one. So somewhere like the resultant, it will be somewhere like this. So it will try to come closer to this stable region. So that's why all those nucleides which are lying in this region, so they are beta minus emitters. And all those nucleides which are somewhere like this, they are beta plus emitters. So this you can also check for beta plus. So suppose if I talk about a positron decay example. So in this case, so we have a carbon 611 and when it is emitting 
positron so in that case atomic number decreases by 1 so it is emitting a positron particle so in this case so if here it is carbon so it's z or proton number it decreases by 1 from 6 to 5 and neutron number it increases by 1 so this plus 1 this is minus 1 and the resultant it is somewhere like towards this stability band so you can see that here six proton and there are five neutron and here proton number is decreased by 1 and the neutron number it is increased by 1 so these all are emitting beta plus or positron particles or somewhere like the electron capture so in the electron captures all those excited nuclei so they are capturing those electrons which are existing in the atomic structures so in the electron capture process suppose this is the nucleus so this is the electron which are present in the first atomic orbit so somewhere when this nucleus it is in the excited state and it is having sufficient energy so that if the energy of this nucleus it is greater than the binding energy of this electron then this nucleus it will capture a electron from this first s orbital and this process is known as electron capture process so these all are those nucleides which exist below this stability belt so they try to come to a more stable region by undergoing electron capture process or by undergoing positron emission so we will discuss about this beta decay alpha decay and gamma decay when we discuss about the concept of radioactivity so at the moment i just uh, uh, leave it here so this is uh, all about the summary so you can see that when in the beta minus decay the neutron turns into a proton so all those nuclei which exist above the valley in the proton or positron emission so they exist below these valleys so alpha decay so all those nuclei which is having atomic number greater than 83 so all those radioactive particles so they can emit alpha particle no enough alpha particle neutron number and proton number so they both decreases so that's why they try to come closer to this stability band so next we will discuss about the very important concept of binding energy now binding energy you all are familiar with you have studied during your graduation so binding energy is that energy which is binding those nuclei within this nucleus so if i talk about the total energy of the bound system it is always less than the combined energy of these separated nucleons now the difference in energy is known as the binding energy of the nucleus so on the other way around i can say that the energy required to break a nucleus into its constituent nucleons is known as the binding energy of the nucleus so this is the formula that is the einstein famous relation mass energy relationship which we use in order to find the binding energy of a nucleon so you, with this formula of uh, mass energy relationship so which uh, uh, make the einstein a very famous equation and still people are using this uh, formula that is e is equal to delta m c square in order to find out the new particle like the discovery of god particle it is also based on this relation how the concept of this matter and anti part anti matter so they are being uh, exchanging their energy and how uh, we are trying to find out uh, uh, by breaking or by interacting uh, uh, these protons uh, at a very high energy and then we can we are breaking these proton and looking at uh, what type of particles which are coming out from these uh, elementary particles so the binding energy it can be calculated 
from this einstein mass energy relationship and this is the formula which we found so eb is known as the binding energy z is known as the number of protons which are present or within the nucleus mh which is representing the hydrogen or the proton mass n is number of neutron mn that is representing the mass of neutron and this is the mass of nucleus so the total mass of the nucleons it is always greater than the mass of nucleus so when these nucleons so they combine to make a particular nucleus so like something like a nuclear fusion uh, reaction so you will see that those two proton or those two neutron uh, nucleons so they are interacting at a, a very high temperature so at a very high energy and when they interact with each other and you will see that how much energy which is being released in this nuclear fusion so similarly you can see that this fraction of uh, change in uh, masses it can generate a huge amount of energy so these masses they are expressed in atomic mass units so <coughs> so i prefer to write e is equal to mc square to e is equal to delta mc square because there is a change in energy whenever there is a associated change in mass so why there is associated change in mass because whenever a system loses some energy so what does it means so this energy it comes from the converting a bit of mass which is creating that energy so this is the famous uh, idea of einstein so we can identify that uh, the change in mass how we can find out what is the energy which is being generated so mass is it is not absolutely conserved so if we talk about the theory of relativity so mass it is uh, absolutely changing so when uh, these particles so it depends upon with which velocity these particles are changing so in the relativistic regime so when the particle they are moving at a very high speed or at a speed which is greater than the speed of light then the mass of this particular nucleon so it changes into 1 minus v square over c square so that is the gamma factor so the value of this mass it is not absolutely conserved in all frames of references so for a exothermic reaction so exothermic reactions are those reactions in which energy is released so how much energy is released that we can calculate the change in masses between these reactant and between these products so the units which we generally use how these energy is being calculated so that is calculated in terms of joules and from that joules we can convert it into mega electron volt because the energy released by these nucleons i be the or by these electron it is very very high so we need to calculate it in terms of mega electron volt or in terms of giga electron volt so for that we need to find out the mass defect so imagine there are two nucleons so they are coming together and they are forming a nucleus no in such a process so what do you think so there is either a energy released or there is some sort of energy which is being absorbed or similarly if we are increasing these number of nucleons and you will see that the we are increasing the number of nucleons and the more and more energy it is being released and similarly if there are many many nucleons within the nucleus and when we are interacting all those nucleons so like in a nuclear fission reaction so the energy which is very very high so similarly the change in energy so the mass of the nucleus form it is always smaller than the combined mass of these free nucleons and how much smaller it is what does it means how much energy it is being lost 
within that reaction or for that particular reaction now if we talk about this carbon 16 example and i will try to calculate how much energy or how much binding energy which takes place for this particular reaction so there are six number of protons six number of new 10 uh, number of neutrons so something like c6 16 so six protons and 10 neutrons and six electrons so if the atomic mass of this carbon it is given 16.014 so the atomic mass and the mass number so they are two different values and the value of this atomic mass it can be greater than the mass number or the atomic mass it can be less than the mass number so from that we can get the idea about whether the reaction it is a endothermic reaction or it is a exothermic reaction so for everything is given so mass of an electron this is this much in atomic mass unit and the mass of this nucleus which we can calculate so this is the atomic uh, atomic mass and if we decrease the number of electrons so this is our nuclear mass so atomic mass it is slightly higher as compared to nuclear mass and if we try to calculate this mass of protons and neutrons and you will see that mass of one proton is 1.007 amu and mass of one neutron it is 1.008 atomic mass unit and how many protons and neutrons so they are present in this carbon nuclei so if we multiply with that and we will find that so this is the value of total mass of protons and neutron and if you compare these two values you will see that there is a slightly differ in their mass values so this value it is slightly greater as compared to this value so what does it means it means that when we are combining these nucleons in order to form a carbon nucleus so its mass get reduced very very less in fractions and how much mass it has been reduced that is being converted into energy and from that we can calculate how much energy is being released so that energy is known as the binding energy so if you look at the other way around so i have write it in a very clear manner so this is the value of delta m so delta m is known as the change in mass which is known as the mass defect so mass defect is that value when we are interacting protons or neutrons to making it a nucleus so in that case so this mass mass it is being less of the product as compared to reactant and this mass we can calculate in terms of energy so there are two approaches so if you check your books so in all your books we generally do not talk about so carbon nucleus oxygen nucleus we generally talk about carbon atom oxygen atom uranium atom so when we try or when we find out this binding energy so we generally find this binding energy of that particular atom so more closer way so what we can write or how we can uh, write this binding energy in the modified formula so if we elect add these electrons within this proton and we add these electron within this nucleus so this become a complete atom so when we add electrons within the protons so we generally write mass of hydrogen atom so that's why so the formula it is always written in terms of hydrogen atom and in terms of atomic masses so this is the example of the mass defect and nuclear binding energy
so calculate the mass defect and nuclear binding energy per nucleon for carbon so the mass of carbon is given so they have calculated it in terms of so this is the value of delta m and when we multiply it with c square and how we can find out these values in terms of mega electron volt so this is the clear explanation so if i write this value and if i convert it in terms of kilograms so if i multiply with 1.66 into 10 is to power minus 27 and then i multiply it with c square so this is the value of delta m in kilogram so this is in meter per second square so this value it comes out in terms of joules now when i divide it with joule nu j if i have to convert joules into mega electron volt so then i have to convert it firstly into electron volt so i will divide it at 1.6 into 10 is to power minus 19 and if i have to convert it into mega electron volt so then i will further divide it into 10 is to power 6 so when i multiply this with 1 over 1.6 into 10 is to power minus 13 so then you can convert these unit from joule into mega electron volt so many students so they get confused in these calculations during the exam so you can remember this way so this formula one atomic mass unit so how it is being calculated so that you can find out by these calculations <clears throat> so what is the difference between these binding energy and binding energy per nucleon so if you look at this curve so this curve shows that the value of this binding energy so it increases as we are increasing the atomic number <clears throat> so for very lighter nuclei the binding energy per nucleon it is very very less and as we increase the value so its value starts to increase so the nuclear with mass number greater than 60 so they are not as strongly bound as they are in the middle of this periodic table so all those nucleons so which are lying somewhere here so they are the most stable nuclei in the periodic table and the maximum stability that is generally considered of nickel and iron so nickel 60 and iron 56 so they are the most stable nuclei so there is a decrease in binding energy so at a greater than 60 so you will see that so further this graph so it try to have a decrement so energy is released so when these heavy nucleons so they split up into fission so those nucleons so which are lying somewhere here in this binding energy per nucleon belt so they are more favorable for the nuclear fission phenomena and the nucleons which are lying somewhere here in this case so they are more favorable for the nuclear fusion phenomena <clears throat> so this is somewhere so all those nucleides so all those particles who are lying in this region so having a greater than 60 so they are more favorable for these fission spontaneous fission phenomena and all these nuclei so they are more favorable for this fusion phenomena so in both these cases the reaction would be endothermic so what are the more stable nuclei so which are lying somewhere in this stability belt so they are the more stable nuclei so these are some of the important points which are you can find out from this binding energy per nucleons so nickel 2862 it is considered as the largest binding energy per nucleon which is having a value of 8.8 .8 mega electron volt 
so this is the most stable nuclei and packing fraction so the packing fraction it also explain so lesser the value of this packing fraction so more stable these nuclei are so you will see that so these are the packing fraction it is very very high so the negative value of packing fraction it shows that so these are the nucleons which are lying somewhere here in this region so they are the more stable or most stable nuclei so when the value of this packing fraction it exceeds zero and the plus value of packing fraction so those shows they are less stable nuclei so packing fraction represents how the nucleons so they are packed within these nucleus and the value of this packing fraction that we will calculate with delta m over a so this sigma or this sigma m that is representing the mass defect per nucleon so for atomic masses which are very close to whole number that they differ by their integer with a small value so this deviation it is expressed in terms of packing fraction how much value of their atomic masses it differ from their integer values so this is all about for today's lecture now we will discuss so if me mp and mh they are the rest mass of electron proton and hydrogen so which formula which is exactly representing the binding energy so binding energy formula you all are study so you can calculate from here so binding energy which we can write down so z mass of proton plus a minus z that is representing the number of neutrons minus mass of nuclei into c square so this equation becomes binding energy over c square so mp so the nucleus it is hydrogen atom so z is 1 n is again 1 so c square comes here so the correct value of this mh so that is the mass of this hydrogen nucleus so this is our hydrogen nucleus so this values comes out to be you can calculate it is mp plus mn minus 13.6 electron volt now since he is talking about these uh, atomic configuration so here he has considered the mass and the energy values for the uh, hydrogen atom so that is of the order of minus 13.6 electron volt so that is given for the ground state so you can put the value of this binding energy so that is of the order of 13.6 electron volt over c square so option b is the correct option so next is a neutron of mass m is moving inside a nucleus assume the nucleus to be a cubical box of size 10 is to power minus 14 meter with impenetrable walls the value of planck's constant is given how much energy of this neutron will be no mass of neutron it is given that is of the order of 10 is to power minus 27 kg so nucleus of cubical box so the value of delta x so within which that neutron it is moving so that is of the order of 10 is to power minus 14 meter so using the heisenberg uncertainty principle from that you first have to calculate the momentum of this nucleus so that will be of the order of 10 raised to power minus 34 over delta x so delta x so here there is a trick now we have given that the nucleus it is a cubical box 
so the length of a cube so everywhere it is the same so delta x so it can maximum travel to a distance of delta x so if it is given a spherical nucleus then we have to consider here the value of delta x that is equal to 2 times r so you need to look at these small small uh, important points so what is being asked in the questions so that is of the order of 10 is to power minus kilogram meter per second no energy that we generally know that is of the order of p square over 2 m no this neutron it can travel in three dimension so we need to mention all those momentums along x axis along y axis along z axis so it comes out to be p square tan is to power minus 20 square so that is equal to tan is to power minus 30 uh, minus 40 over 2 into mass of neutron so that is of the order of tan is to power minus 27 so it comes out to be of the order of when you calculate so that is 1.5 mega electron volt and this result that is more or less close to a value of the binding energy of this nucleon so option c is the most appropriate option for this problem so next question is let mp and mn be the mass of proton and neutron and m1 is the mass of the neon nucleus and m2 is the mass of calcium nucleus then find out the correct relation so these relation so they are given so we need to find out the correct relation so we have studied that the nuclear mass nuclear mass is always less than their constituent particles so the mass of the nucleus it is always less than the total number of protons and neutrons so far in this neon nucleus there are 10 number of protons plus 10 number of neutron and similarly the mass of this calcium nucleus it is less as compared to total number of constituents particle so second the binding energy of the nuclei so which is having large number of nucleons so binding energy of this calcium nuclei so which is having 20 proton and 20 neutron so it is greater as compared to binding energy of this neon nucleus so when you calculate these binding energies by putting these values of m1 and comparing these values you will see that the mass of this m2 of calcium nucleus so that is coming of the order of 10 times the mass of proton plus mass of neutron plus mass of this nucleons so which is equal to 2 times the mass of this neon nucleus so the most appropriate answer for this question is m1 less than 10 mp m2 less than 20 and m2 that is less than 2 times the mass of nucleus so option b is the correct option so this is another important problem which can come from this uh, binding energy so there is a histogram which is giving for the binding energy per nucleons with respect to mass number so a nucleus with mass number 180 fission into two nuclei of equal masses so what is being said that a nucleus whose mass number is 180 it is being broken down into two small nuclei of equal masses that is of 
1990 masses no what we have to find so we have to find whether there is a release of energy or there is a absorb of energy so so the reaction is something like this so we have to calculate plus minus delta e no first these are reactant nuclei so we need to find out this binding energy of heavy nuclei the binding energy of this heavy nuclei if you look at this so whose mass is 180 so somewhere mass 180 so it will be somewhere here and you see that its binding energy per nucleon that is of the order of 4 mega electron volt so binding energy of 1 is 4 mega electron volt and there are 180 nucleons so total binding energy will be 720 mega electron volt so similarly now we have to find the binding energy of these two nuclei so binding energy of lighter nuclei so if we calculate so it is 90 so 90 is somewhere here so binding energy of one nucleon that is of the order of 6 nuclei so 9 into 6 that is of the order of moshi 540 so similarly for the second nuclei because there are two small nuclei which is being released so total energy so far this product that is of the order of 10080 mega electron volt so what does it means it means that product nuclei have higher binding energy as compared to reactant nuclei so how much energy is extra released so that is 1080 minus 720 so that is of the order of 360 mega electron volt and energy is being released so this much extra energy it is being released so option c is the correct option so this is the last question for our today's lecture so in this the binding energy per nucleon versus mass number curve is given so the process that would release energy so there are given four processes and we have to find which process energy is being released so let us try to solve each one now in y is equal to 2z now if you look at y so where is y so y is having mass number 60 and energy is 8.5 so 8.5 into 60 that is of the order of 510 and it is being converted into z so z is this much 30 into 5 so that is equal to 300 so reactant energy is 500 product energy is less so what does it means so energy is being absorbed in this reaction so reactant energy is less but product energy is uh, reactant energy is more while product energy is less so what does it means in this energy is absorbed so in the second reaction w to x plus z no w is this one 120 into 7.5 so x is 90 into 80 plus z is 30 into 5 so it comes out to be 870 so this is 900 and this is 870 so product energy is less as compared to reactant so energy is being absorbed during this reaction so third is w to 2y so w so w in w so that is 
120 into 7.5 into 2y. So y is 60 into 8.5. So when you calculate, so it is 900, and in this case, 1020. so product energy is more as compared to reactant so energy is being released so this option is the correct option so this is all about the binding energy packing fraction so you all can calculate so whenever whatever type of numerical comes so in our next lectures so we will uh, try to solve what type of various energies so which exist which are uh, uh, making their contribution in this binding energy and then we will discuss the concept of liquid drop model we will explain the semi empirical mass formula and then we will explain the another uh, the other applications of uh, the spontaneous nuclear fission phenomena so that is explained by the bohr and wheeler theory uh, uh, using the liquid drop model so i hope you uh, have uh, enjoyed this lecture and uh, if you have any queries you can ask me so the session is open for discussions